Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results. Hi, I'm Perry Holly, a Maxwell Leadership Facilitator and Coach. And I'm Chris Cody, Executive Vice President with Maxwell Leadership. Welcome and thank you for joining. Today's topic is things leaders do to win. And all you had to put in there was win. Like, I'm in. Like, what, <laughs> what, what do we need to do? That competitive side uh, comes out. And so yeah. things that leaders do to win. That's what we're going to talk about today. Before we do, I want to encourage you to visit maxwellleadership.com slash podcast. If you'll click on this podcast, fill out a form, we'll come help your team win. That's right. We're ready. And so whether it's we're the winners. Five, we are winners. Yeah. <laughs> Before uh, uh, we get started, if you want to do that, and, and we can come and help with the five levels of leadership, uh, the new gen- the the new training that we have around new kind of diversity, which we're retitling, by the way, mm-hmm. to leading multi-generational teams, whether it's conflict management, whatever it might be to help you win, we want to be able to do that. Well, in John's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, he talks about the law of victory. Leaders find a way for the team to win. That's what we're going to talk about today. Yes, so I've been teaching this. I did a 21 Laws course recently, and I noticed the leaders in the class, when we talk about the law of victory, it's kind of a, yeah, yeah, I I got that. We're going to win. But then I reflected on myself, and I said, I... I'd have to say it's not something I I like to win. I'm willing to do what it takes to win. I work hard to try and win, but I don't really think of as a leader, what are the things you need to be doing Mm. to, to put your team in the best place to win. And there's been a lot of change. A lot's been going on in the environment. I'm just, so many of the people that uh, clients Mm. we're working with are going through incredible uh, changes and dynamics and marketplaces and industries and challenges that we're facing on many fronts and the pressure's on. Uh, and a lot of these great leaders, um, if they're at their best, they said, uh, whatever is inside of you when you get squeezed comes out. And I just want to say, are we, uh, are we putting the best in us? Are we setting ourselves up for the best chance to win? And I, I think it's something that's often overlooked. So I decided to take it on as a topic. Yeah. And I love, I love the focus on the team winning, not just the leader winning. Oh yeah. Right, uh, the law of victory, and so I think that's key because, by the way, when the team wins, you will win. Mm-hmm. Uh, too many leaders that we've worked with and we've seen out there, that may not be the case. And so, while you win in the short term, that won't be long term uh, for you if we're not doing it in and through the team. And so, one of the things I I I, I want to talk about, as you were just saying, is what type of as a leader, what type of thoughts and and leadership learnings are you putting? in your head and, and on your heart, developing yourself in the role of training. What does that look like? Mm-hmm. And um, I think so much, and I've learned a lot about this over the last maybe five years or so, about the mindset. Um, your thoughts are going to dictate your reality to mm-hmm. some extent. There is a tie between the two of them. And so I would challenge us to say, man, what are, do you have those winning thoughts for you and for your team? And, and what does that look like? And, um, are, are you getting yourself to the point where when opportunities show up, you're ready and, and you've done the, the preparation? And I also think that those that like to win and, and are victorious leaders, you and I talk a lot about sports, and we can think about some great examples of what that looks like, have one thing in common, is that, man, they will not accept defeat, no matter what that looks like. And what I, I, I thought about when that I read that statement was, it reminds me of John whenever there's a problem, or there's a challenge or what we're thinking about, he always says, well, there is an answer. <laughs> Somewhere, <That's right. laughs> someone has an answer to that. We just got to figure out what that is. And mm-hmm. let's not stop there is an answer. until we become victorious, until we figure that out. And so people, some people are like, oh, yeah, well, there's no answer to that. We're out. Or we can't do that. No, that's not the case. You got the right mindset. You got to understand that there is always an answer. And um, a lot of these leaders, they just don't accept the fact that there's not an answer. And we just need to keep that in mind. I, we we're talking, you and I were talking off camera about uh, some sports we watched this weekend. And that uh, uh, when adversity, with well, a quote I had read, was that when a, a real competitor, somebody that's set up to win, when they face adversity, it, it becomes fuel to yeah. overcome it, to win. But if, if adversity drives you to making excuses, then that's what uh, that defines a quitter. A quitter uses adversity as an excuse to stop. Mm. A winner 
Uh, somebody going to go for victory uses adversity as a pro pro propulsion to to win. And we watched one of these athletes that was had every excuse in the world to so, not compete. Yeah, but he said, I, "I will." I would you had you phrase that? I, I refuse to not win. Yeah, I refuse to give it go over to it. So. Uh, when you think about the law of victory, John has a couple of uh, teaching, maybe three components that he mentions in that. And I really like these um, to view your team's dedication to victory. And the first one was a unity of vision uh, that teams, he says, teams succeed only when the players have a unified vision. No matter how much talent or potential there is, doesn't matter if you don't have a unified vision. And so I, my question I'd place for you was, how do you as a leader ensure the team or the players have a unified mm -hmm. vision? It kind of sounds, yeah, oh, yeah, we're all on the same page, but is it that easy? It is not that easy. <laughs> uh, you can think about, let's stay on the sports uh, topic for just a minute. You think about some big-time college programs, a guy that just retired, thankfully for us Georgia fans, um, and you think about the talent and the mm -hmm. different types of people that uh, players that, that he would bring in year after year, and yet there was one consistency, which was his voice on what we're going to do, what the vision is of that. And so we need to make sure, and he owned it, right? I think so what we're trying to communicate here is, man, we really want for each of you to take ownership of what that vision is. you got to own it here first before you can communicate it out to the team. And then we want to encourage our team to own it, right? And And if not, then there's... You know, uh, there's there's other conversations that you might need to have. I have this little phrase that that I use when it comes to the whole team and the vision and times where I say we need to make sure we have individual responsibility because you're there for a reason. Mm -hmm. You have KPIs, but we need to have collective pride, right. right? Individual responsibility and collective pride. And I think in order to continue to do this with the vision, we need to communicate it clearly, and we need to make sure that it's compelling. I've had some leaders that I've worked with, you probably as well, who are like, hey, what's the vision of your team or the organization? And they get done, you're like, what? <laughs> right? Like, you don't even seem like you're compelled by that. <laughs> right. So so when you have that unity of the vision, make sure you're communicated in a clear way and yeah. a way that's compelling to those that are on the team. How, how frequent? Is this a... Uh... Often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can't do it enough. Yeah, because I think that was my one of my problems was I would I gave, I gave my vision at the January kickoff and said they got it. Guess what? They don't got it. Yeah, so, yeah. Do you, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. We what? Well, so we're a couple of months into 2024 as we're recording this, and I have a team meeting every Monday, and we start the meeting. Here's the vision, yep. and we did it this morning. Right, and the and, and the then values. our values. Yeah, values. And right. I actually asked one Susan Davis, one of our facilitators, was in the meeting with us. I said, Hey, Susan. I know you were on the road serving three different kind clients last week. Pick one of those values and give me an example why. And so she she brought it to life. Yeah. So you got there's you, you can't do it too much. You yeah. you need to keep it in front of yourself and the team often. Good answer. Good answer. Uh, John also says number two. So you have a uh, unity of vision. You must have diversity of skills. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and he points out, can you imagine an entire hockey team that was only goalies, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> or a business where it was only salespeople? It doesn't make sense. You need to have a diversity of that. And every organization requires diverse talents and skills to succeed. Um, do you think this is a problem in the workplace today? Or we, uh, do leaders build teams uh, with the people that are a lot like them, the leader, and not uh, and miss out on the diversity of not only diversity of people, but diversity of skills, tasks, talents? What's your thoughts? Capital letters, yes. <laughs> right? Exclamation points. Uh, you bring up a really good point, right? We attract who we are oftentimes mm -hmm. versus what we really need uh, on a team or what we want on a team. And so oftentimes that we will, we will default to that. And so 100%, I think we can do a better job of uh, diversifying our team. One of the things I'd love for you to talk about as I throw it back to you is we, we just, what well, maybe a year or so ago, we had a, a client where we helped, develop a course called inclusive leadership mm -hmm. because we need to continue to get more diverse on our teams. There's no doubt about that. But we also need to understand that in that diversity, we don't need to squelch it. We need to understand how do we inclusively lead all of that diversity. So talk just a little bit about that course because it's a powerful uh, training for teams. Well, the big learning for me was that, and I'm a little embarrassed that 
I would develop teams, and we have a like me bias. It's just part of it. Is it is it easier to get along with people that are like you? Is it easier, like you said, to attract people that are like you? We kind of fit into each other and all that, but that is no way to win because um, we all think the same, and if yeah. we all think the same, yeah. but a lot of us aren't necessary. So what we need different thinking, different backgrounds, different different experiences, um, and, and a lot of this different thinking is what adds to our richness of how we go to market. Yeah. Uh, but the problem and what we uncovered with learning about the I and DEI about inclusiveness is that even if you hire the most diverse team possible, you have a lot of people that aren't like you. They bring diverse thoughts, background, experiences, skills, um, but they feel excluded or they don't feel like they belong or they don't feel welcome. They don't feel psychologically safe. They will, the word is, assimilate to be like you because it's not safe to be different than you. So I'll just be like you, and I, I tell them it's salute and stay mute. And I'll just go along, and you lose everything that you built. So two ways to uh, get diversity of skill is, you know, to, uh, to have a, a, a non-diversity of skills is one, to hire it and then treat them exclusively so they don't participate or just to hire a bunch of people like you. Yeah. So the big aha for me about when people, when you're an inclusive leader, people feel welcome, safe, valued in the big word, they feel like they belong. Yeah. And when they do that, it gives them a psychological safety to not fit in, be what you want, but to belong, to be who they really are. That's good. And if you show up who you really are, then you feel safe to tell me what you really think and how you can really add value. And now we can go to market in a really strong way. So, And leaders, you, you know, know you oftentimes, up yeah, yeah, we're completely, you know, off, off kind of where we're going, but that's, a, it's so true. And oftentimes as leaders, we say, you know, again, we're talking about th things leaders need to do to win. And as we look through this with the diversity of skill, we know we need it. And we may even be have enough growth to where we go, okay, I know I'm going to attract who I am, but that's not what I need. So we find the right time. And then they join the team. And to your point, they're, they change them. Yeah. And and then all of a sudden now they, they squelch them. They don't feel like they belong. You're not going to get the best out of them. And I promise you the team won't win if you don't understand how to do that. Hey, podcast listeners, many of you listening right now would probably love the autonomy that comes with owning your own business or becoming a coach that helps other businesses succeed. Well, we have a phenomenal strategy where you are 100% in control of your own business, earning income on your own terms, and have access to the people, tools, and resources you need to build a thriving leadership development business. When you become a Maxwell Leadership Certified Team Member, you join a global community of entrepreneurs led by our expert team of mentors and faculty, including John C. Maxwell. You'll also get one of the top leadership certifications in the world next to your name, giving you the boost you need to get started. Visit us online at maxwellleadership.com forward slash join the team to find out more. Number three from John after diversity of skills and unity of vision was uh, raising players mm. to their potential. Uh, the leaders that win not only see potential in others, but they invest in developing mm. potential in others. This is in our sweet spot here, but 100%. always telling leaders about what are you doing not only to develop yourself, but to develop your team. Yeah, this, this does not happen by accident. We have to be intentional about it. And I think um, this comparison that I wrote down as I was thinking about, wow, what are what are some of the leaders that I've seen in the past that I've admired that I've seen win continuously over and over again, is that they do have this. Let me develop them as an individual and then empower them to run. Not although we need this, not train them and then delegate to them. That 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 is a massive difference you know, between those two mm -hmm. statements right there. And I think if you're going to win repetitively, you got to get into the place of how am I developing and then empowering versus just training and then delegating tasks to them. So a uh, last comment, maybe you give us thought on it, but so we have this, we want, we want unity of vision and we have diversity of skills. Um, that diversity can be differences in people. Is it the, the idea of, bringing them together, that, that diversity of skill and outlook and backgrounds and all that, bringing that together under a unity of vision doesn't seem like an automatic thing. It, it seems like not. it might be a little bit of an uphill. Any coaching thoughts on if you're a leader, if you have this rich diversity, how do you bring them into focus as one? 
Well, that I think is your job, no doubt. That's your number one job. You want the team to win. You want the team to exceed its expectations. You got to figure that out and what that might look like. There's many things that come to mind. Tools that we use, the values cards mm-hmm. are one. I also think that um, there is common ground somewhere. There is a common ground somewhere in that in that group that you can find. Yeah. Um, and I think the more that you can, as a team, get to know each other on a personal level and bring those walls down. And we talk about this often where we'll do, with an executive leadership team, we'll do a simple values card exercise. Men and women that have worked together for 15 years. And they walk out and they go, man, Perry, I had no idea mm-hmm. that this happened. This is why that's important to you. And so there are things that you can do at a much deeper level than, you know, just team building, jumping off high ropes and all that stuff. All that, that would be fun. <laughs> and you could do that. Um, I absolutely think that that is your number one goal. You should continually be thinking about how do I make this team work more efficiently, effectively together. Right. I, I love that. And seeing everyone's seeing each other, even though we're different, we see each other uh, as one and we see each other as valued and, and belonging. Everybody belongs to yeah. this team to yeah. do that, to do that. So yeah, we have this thing, uh, that we've learned from another leader that talks about sharing your, your, your personal, your professional, you know, and your financial goals, whatever the conversation mm-hmm. might be with. And the more that you learn about them and you develop common language inside that team and understand each other, um, then you're going to, you're going to drive that to a different level. You know, we also, uh, a while back did the, um, change your world value table. Yeah, which is awesome. That was like six, one, one hour a, a week for six weeks. But boy, we came out of that as a different group. Yeah. Uh, even then we have a lot of different backgrounds on our team. But I, I recall, mm-hmm. I mean, first we go, what in the world are we doing? By about week three going, my goodness. I what, remember you what saying that. Yeah, what have I learned about these this? people? <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's. It, I think anything like that that has some type of substance to it is beneficial. Well, as we wrap up, Um, The first step in practicing the law of victory is taking responsibility for the success of the team department or organization that you lead. It must become personal. Like I think about that. Like I, I want our team, I want the team that I'm a part of to, to succeed. And what does that look like? And, and how do I go about doing that? What do I need to do to your point in that last question? How do I need to bring them together? What are some things that need to happen? And, and, and what do I need to share? or They need to share with each other. And so some things I wrote down here as, as a wrap up is, man, make sure that as you think about things that we need to do and that we covered in the three principles, make sure that you're leading by example. Make sure you're taking responsibility. Uh, leadership is contagious. And so that they see those things in you. Make sure you're communicating effectively. And then I want to encourage you as you guys get small wins along the way. This is one of the things that that I love to do is, is to recognize and show appreciation to the individual, but bring the team in on that. That's really good. Right. Mm-hmm. So that we're not just, Hey, you know, Perry, good job over here. But like, we're talking about as a team man, the team won today because Perry hit his KPIs here and, mm-hmm. and you kind of, you, you kind of um, just combine the two of them. And when you do that, one of the things I think it'll do is it'll begin to create slowly a culture of success. It's like, this is what we do here. Culture of victory. Uh, culture of victory, right? Like, yeah. we're going to figure it out. There is an answer. We're going to, you know, Mark Cole, our CEO, says often, like, I may not accomplish it, but when you find my dead body, it'll be pointed <laughs> in that direction, right? Like, that's the mentality that we have and we need to create in our team. All right. Good. Great insights. Uh, as a reminder, if you'd like to know more about these offerings, like the 360 Leader or Five Levels or our podcast family, you can do all that at maxwellleadership.com slash podcast. You can also leave us a comment or a question there. We love hearing from you. Very grateful you'd spend this time with us today. That's all today from the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast. Mm-hmm.